<laughs> Welcome everyone. So good to have some friendly faces in the room today and some fresh faces. Um, we are here with the School of Lunch founders, Chuck Barth and Hillary Boynton. Thank you guys so much for joining today. How's it going? Great. Thank you so much for having us. We're so excited to be here. Yes, yes. Amazing. So stoked. Well, it's going to be a really fun few minutes that we have with everyone. Um, or actually 75 minutes. So I cannot wait to hear more about what you guys have been working on, what's the latest, and also a bit of your background and story. So as we're waiting for a few more folks to kind of filter in as these um, uh, kind of like tardy birds arrive, as always with these webinars, um, I'd love to just invite everyone to drop in the chat, just disrupt wherever you came from in your day. What's bringing you this conversation today? What is really intriguing and fascinating to you about what you know about School of Lunch or Farm to School Networks or just bringing regenerative rascals and kiddos into the conversation of regenerative agriculture. Um, so let's draw some of those threads and maybe drop in where you're coming from as well. And in the meantime, Hillary and Chuck, how's the day been? I know you guys were at school earlier and I'm sure it's crazy. You guys just went back to school this week, right? Yeah, well, last week we had a training Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're training our staff and getting new staff up to speed and all and like all of us getting reacquainted with the kitchen because we haven't been there for 18 months and we had to clean, oh clean and cook, painted the whole thing. And then we had Thursday, Friday lunch. And then, you know, now we're on today, Wednesday. Yes. So we've had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and we're feeding 150 instead of 95. So it's like, you know, Oh my gosh. Wow. So you guys went up like 60. Oh my gosh. This is so amazing. And that, yeah. So yeah, it's like kindergarten through 12 now. So we have like all of a sudden these teeny little people that I'm like, oh my oh. gosh, they're so, so tiny. <laughs> it's all, it's the beautiful. They're, they're so, so cute. But like many people, you know, through the COVID uh, slowdown of things, we literally shut down the kitchen for 18 months. So literally the, the meat slicer yesterday was the first time it was used again. So we're just pulling things yeah. out and, and bringing them back together. So we're waking up a kitchen. It's like waking back up what we did before, yeah. before this whole thing went into uh, suspended animation. Yeah, right. Like a slumbering giant, like all the kids are back in school and you guys are like, wow, let's dust off the, the cooking utensils and all the good stuff. That's amazing. Well, I cannot wait to hear more. It's going to be so fun to dive into all of these things. Um, let's kick it off, team. I just wanted to welcome anyone who, if this is your first time in the Farmer's Footprint community, Huge welcome. Thank you so much for being a part of the solution. And I have so much gratitude for every person taking some time to dedicate, you know, some attention, what an invaluable and amazing resource that we have to storytellers and people of change agents like Hillary and Chuck within this movement of regeneration and healthy foods. And now let's talk about healthy schools. So it's so fun web weaving with each of you. And Hillary and Chuck, thank you so much for dedicating some time today. Super grateful to have your knowledge and experiences here in the circle. Of course. Um, thank you. Cool. Well, let's let's get everyone kind of like situated and centered in the space together. I'm going to share a quick video, if anyone missed it, of the Lunch Lady documentary. So this will kind of get you guys oriented to a bit of Hillary's work and how things started out. Um, and it's just a really beautifully well done film. So this will be a little teaser. You'll have to hop off and watch the rest afterwards. All right, so here we go. We've always been interested in introducing students to a very healthy, nutritious lunch program and food program and snack program. And we've been pretty successful, but as the school's grown larger, it's been harder and harder to give them something consistently um, that's really healthy and engaging on a daily basis. And then Hillary arrived. This is the generation of kids that's going to demand better with our food system. I am Hillary Boynton and I am the lunch lady. <gasps> First in line. I hope to be a new face of the lunch lady and inspire people to graduate from culinary school and nutrition school or whatever and be like, I want to be a lunch lady. I want to go back and make a difference. Let's make it like a little party for them. Do it. It's really, really special and unique that it's local, in season, pasture raised, grass fed, the best. It's a true farm to table experience and these kids are getting exposed to the most nutrient dense foods 
that I can find in our local food system. Beautiful grass fed beef, onion, garlic, coconut meals. I think of every component that goes into it and how we're balancing it, introducing different fats and different flavors and color, color. Digestion starts with your eyes. There's a real deep awareness, and as a published author who's thought a lot about this, she has a way that she assembles the ingredients that they are absorbed and assimilated without a lot of the ups and downs that a lot of other foods just naturally or unnaturally create in human. I wrote a book called The Heal Your Gut Cookbook, so I understand the power of fermented foods and healthy fats and bone broths. This is a Gorgeous. Just a taste, right? But I just am so, yes, Indy's clapping. I love this. What an amazing, amazing just journey that you've been on. And to just give folks a little bit more background around your story, Hillary, um, you are, I'm just so impressed. I mean, being a mother of five teenagers, a school lunch lady that you completely kickstarted and overhauled the Manzanita Schools Lunch Program. You co-founded School of Lunch. You've written a cookbook. And you know, you've provided deep healing within your own family and community. So beyond that, you now have a podcast, you're helping people on social media, just getting facts and amazing like resources out to folks. And it's just, you're such a shot of life in these conversations. So I'm so excited to hear more about all of the things that are happening now. And Chuck, you also have really, really amazing deep roots within the local food systems. Chuck, you've been on the CDFA and Farmer's Market Advisory Committee, and you're the current head of Slow Food Ventura County. So we've got some knowledge in the house, you guys. It's such a pleasure to have you both here. And I really want to take people back on this journey of where School of Lunch started, kind of some of the progression of what you guys experienced during COVID and how you had to pivot. And then let's hear about what you guys are rocking on today. There's so many exciting things going on. So please take it away. Okay, I guess, you know, oh my gosh. Well, it made, it made me emotional to watch the video because it's just, I think that was filmed maybe four years ago, three years ago. Three years ago, yeah. So, so much has happened, right, since that time. And it's like, wow, we really have come so far. Like this little dream of like, um, I mean, I never thought I would become the lunch lady, but, uh, you know, through my journey of, you know, healing my children and um, we had a cancer journey in my family, we moved from Massachusetts across to, Los Angeles for a new way of life and healing and all of that. And we landed in Topanga, literally just one day, you know, checking it out and stumbled upon this brand new little school with 30, I think there were 30 kids in the whole school. And um, what drew me to the school really was it was in nature. And the chef there was like, oh, we, you know, we've caught the kids caught their own fish today and cooked it up. And I really want to roast the whole goat. And I was just like, you know, my cookbook had just come out. I'm like, oh my gosh, we found our people and we have to go here. And so that's really, we were like in, full in. And then when the school expanded, they started to outsource the lunches. And that's when I just saw the decline in the quality. And, and so uh, I kind of pushed my way in and became a snack coordinator and then a consultant to the lunch lady. And I think I just totally overwhelmed her. I think what, you know, what I, I don't know that I necessarily intended to do this, but the snack maybe outshined the lunch program a little bit. I would go to the farmer's markets and get all sorts of stuff and be whipping up soups and whatever I could do to make it exciting and fun and engaging for the kids. And then by December, I was just like, I think I think I should take over the lunch program. And meanwhile, I've you know only ever cooked for a family of seven, never worked in a commercial kitchen in my life. So the head of the school was like, if I hand you the keys to the kitchen, can you do this? And I'm like, sure, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, fast forward, here we are, but it has been kind of just boots on the ground, learn as you go. And fortunately, you know, through slow food and whatnot have developed this amazing staff over the years uh, that has just supported uh, me and my journey and um, setting up systems and collaboration. And it's just such a, it's such a beautiful thing. It's like we say, we were, we're like the best restaurant, not in, in a very humble way, we're the best restaurant in LA because we get to serve like the most, amazing clientele, these cute little kids who are so appreciative. And then we, we don't compromise. We have the most amazing ingredients. So a lot of restaurants, you know, have these beautiful ingredients and then some other things in vegetable oil or whatever. So we just, we, we don't compromise. We get to feed ourselves nourishing food. We get to work with the most beautiful ingredients and engage with the um, local farmers and uh, food purveyors and even, you know, local, regional and national food purveyors. So it's super exciting. So that's sort of where we are now. And, um, you know, I can go into 
how, it, well, my vision, I guess, is really to, as I went along with doing the lunch program, I thought, you know, this is replicable, this can be scaled up. And so um, I had this vision of training lunch leaders to sweep across the nation and disrupt the trend of chronic illness in this next generation of kids. So just to inspire people to, um, you don't necessarily even have to wanna be a lunch lady at your kid's school. You can wanna dive into any sort of system that needs, whether it's your own home or a local business or a restaurant or a YMCA, uh, whatever it may be that you desire to, um, to kind of make a change and, and get people kind of thinking about these systems and local foods and stuff. So that's really where we are now with our, we're doing the lunch program and we're consulting with people and we're training lunch leaders and um, just super exciting, yeah. Some of the, um, I think a highlight was to have met Hillary at the farmer's market. And uh, my experiences with uh, the nonprofit Slow Food Ventura County, uh, which straddles the line between Northern, uh, Northwestern LA County uh, and then Ventura County, which it's an agricultural region that runs along the coast, Santa Barbara, up to the central part of the state. And that work, when we started a chapter here, I was worked with a local university and they asked me if I wanted to start a nonprofit because uh, I was interested in food. I was looking for financial help to support and understand how a local butcher shop in the area needed help to be able to create new customers. And they said, well, not sure if we can get that together for them because the book work may not be good for the family, but we figure uh, having a hub that you can help talk about distribution and the things that you're interested in uh, because you like farmer's markets, Chuck, would be a great place to do that. So starting that chapter helped me understand about nonprofits and what we could then do uh, with that opportunity to you know, have a mission. So the mission was in alignment with what Hillary was doing when I met her, which was simply to support the local food system, to support artisan producers. Slow Food as an organization has a history of having events. You know, they could have been called wine and cheese events for a while, you know, uh, based on the model of Chez Panisse and let's all get together and eat some beautiful foods. But it got a lot deeper than that for me because the goal of feeding from the local food system and supporting the, the farmers we knew became relevant when I was watching them disappear from farmers markets in the region because they didn't have enough business. So I felt that I had the opportunity to do some work personally to increase that uh, flow of business to them. So when I met Hillary and she was doing the school lunch program, uh, Slow Foods focus on my doing dinners and getting to meet all these farmers and bringing them together, then had a logical home for it to do things beyond the scope of what I was doing. The, the other thing that happened is I had a background in going to farmers markets and I was looking and meeting all these farmers um, and I, I would buy every week, but I didn't understand the ability to be able to throw dollars at them and really help their bottom line. So when she had a school opportunity and we met at the farmer's market and we met our third partner, Joel there um, at the, on the same day and we both like, there's something magic about Hillary. We all got together and we there wasn't a company at that point, but it was like, we have to do something. And Joel, uh, had a tip to him, made the, the really wonderful video, the lunch lady which you've seen. And that's, yeah, it's a benchmark of how we really all came together around Hillary's mission and her journey as a family to go from her honest understanding of how to nourish a family and then uh, bring it to these children. And so when we met, I was then immediately had kind of a role to support her and we've evolved further in that. And so as a partnership, we're together now, uh, that goes on all the way. You know, you have like a super power person and I've been able to have this other role. And we think that's a really strong thing to highlight is that nurturing component of what she was doing at the school, but being stood behind by a strong male figure who can understand and, and, and use that and work together. And that's really what a, what a, a family support in a food system uh, comes together and makes a strong statement. So we have the good fortune of doing that in both work and at home life. And it's not that it's easy. It's just that we have those shared roles. So I feel particularly fortunate in a household to have that shared thing. And we know many people are one person or the other who don't share that. So that's just something to aspire to. We don't have the perfect answer, but we well, happen to, comes we in, encourage yeah. that in, in other uh, couples or families who are working together in any configuration they have, whatever they want. Mm, so many deep learnings and takeaways just within that first initial answer. And gosh, I feel like I'm spitting with so many follow-up questions and so many good things. So um, 
Yeah, I think that piece that you guys spoke to of, of just creating the unit of a family and letting that be like a micro example of what can happen in a school system or within, you know, a community or within really every aspect of your lives and your children's lives, like you bring yourselves wherever you, wherever you go. So seeing that ability to, to create that reverberation and lead by example with love, you talk about vitamin L and putting love into this food for the kiddos and all that goodness. So that really matters. I think that's something that, you know, is subtle and isn't quite as tangible in a lot of different areas. Um, but when you call attention to it, I think that's really important. So heck so yes, I love that. Right today, this little kindergarten boy, I mean, of course the kindergartners are like, you know, staring at, it's kind of like a retraining of taste buds. A lot of kids, I don't know so much, I don't know who comes from what background or if it's standard American diet or, you know, if they're picky eaters or whatnot. So the, they're so tiny. And so, you know, I brought one kid in to the kitchen today and he's, you know, coming in, he's like, oh, we have music in here. I'm like, yeah, we dance in the kitchen and he's dancing with me and I'm heating up a piece of toast. I'm like, oh my God, we're just like, I'm laying the groundwork for like, I'll do whatever you want. You know, I'm going to have all the little kindergartners like, can you toast a piece of toast for me? But, um, and then I was like, yeah, we put love in our food and we had all of our sourdough like um, proofing right there. So I was like, put some love into the sourdough and he's putting his hands on the sourdough, you know, and it's like higher than he is. And so it was just so cute. And that's where, that's what really makes me, um, it's like something in me just lights up, just seeing the kids engage with their food. And I know it's, it, and I keep saying to the staff and stuff, it takes a little while. You have to just develop this trust. And that's why I want to train lunch leaders because you can't just drop off healthy food at a school and say have at it you have to be this trusted resource that you know can make eye contact every day and encourage them and get them to try new things and you know just get curious about things and you know develop their taste buds so uh, that's really the role of a lunch leader is to um to really show up day after day to to mm -hmm. be that trusted resource I wanted to highlight something that we're really fortunate about, uh, which is we have an outside seating program with the, with the school. It's an outdoor, it's a nature-based school. So the kids get to eat outside in the sunlight and the trees. We, we have a particular right. blessing at this time, you know, in depending on where you are in the country, what kind of enforcement is in place. Uh, the kids are unmasked. And so the lunchtime, they're, they're all in kind of pods and, and but they're unmasked. Uh, and we basically get to function unmasked. And so we have a chance for all of us to be open. It's a, uh, it's a really blessed experience when so many other places feel like in a restaurant culture, um, the kitchens are oftentimes very tight uh, spaces. And there was a lot of issues as we went into the pandemic early. And what's happened as the, as the restaurants and things have opened back up, people have not wanted to go back into kitchens. Uh, and work in the restaurant business. It's very hard. It's hot. It's a lot. A lot of times there's a, a father figure in the chef, and a lot of times they need nurturing, and it's not a healthy place. And so, in this setting that we have, one of the other things we realized is when we have beautiful food, an outdoor setting, a kitchen that is more like has a lot of windows, the doors are always open. Um, we have a kitchen culture that is completely different than what restaurant culture offers in terms of food service. And so we're getting a chance to draw people in and uh, who, are, who are in the food business and we're creating an opportunity to create jobs with the funding that we have through our lunch service to serve people outdoors, to eat this great food that we're buying, and then to also be able to have a different culture. So when we talked about what we're doing at home with good foods, and we'll get into some habits and things as we go on, those same things, the goal this year as we went back into that kitchen and to turn it into something was for me supporting that, uh, holding, holding the structure that Hillary's gonna be working in and that crew, it's to make it feel good to wherever you turn, all of those tools, all of the, those things that support uh, kind of the love and making that food, those things are there for those people. And it's different than having to come and produce a menu and get these meals on the table in five or 10 minutes and yeah. to do all the prep work and to be making the same foods kind of like over every day. And then, you know, at the end of the night, what do you do? Go have a drink or something? Our kitchen culture, because of the outdoors and the and the kind of the nature of it all, I just feel like we have a little blessing. So yeah. when I when I ran into Hillary that way, that continues on. Yeah. That makes so much sense. I think too, there's so much that I'm wondering if folks are kind of curious about, you know, presently, like can you tell us more? 
um, you know, about the programs, about the vision, about where you guys are going. And before you jump in really quickly, I realized I forgot to tell folks, um, if you guys want to make Hillary and Chuck's screen bigger, head over to the three dots um, on their little Zoom window and you can pin them. So it'll kind of like bring them up into the main view for everyone. Um, and then we're gonna keep running through just a few questions, like unearthing all of this amazing deep wisdom and just so many goodness. And then probably about um, in about 20 minutes or so, we're gonna transition to questions and answers. So if you guys are having curiosities that are coming up right now, jot them down, put them in the chat. We're gonna get those um, all answered for you. And I know there's a lot of folks who are doing amazing work or have, know someone who's really excited about transforming their own school or being a part of the solution in that sense. So get ready for that. So yes, John is like so excited. People are stoked. I love this. Um, so just wanted to throw that in there because I forgot to say it earlier, but guys, what's, what's the latest? Like, tell us about the programs. I know you have the Lunch Leader Training Academy. Um, tell us everything. Well, the Lunch Leader Training Academy, we had our first one 2019. Summer 2019. Summer 2019. Just like dove in. We have a beautiful spot in Topanga Canyon, um, a yoga retreat there where we all stay and we cook together and we teach a little bit there, but we also go to um, Plum Pot Farm in Malibu where they have a, a beautiful farm and amazing cooking, teaching kitchen. So we go there for a couple of days. We go off to the farmer's market in Santa Monica. Um, it's really a, an incredible experience. We had it and then it got canceled last summer due to COVID. And then we brought it back this summer. And what I noticed now having done it twice is that, you know, in a short period of time, you know, less than a full week, I think people think they're going to come and get, you know, like knife skills and learn how to cook everything, but it's totally, it's totally different in that it's more of this, like on a cellular level, it's like just this infusion of the love and the nature connection and the human connection and the connection to the local farmers and the local, the food and the animals and the land, all of it. And then the spirit of it all. We always say we're just making a joyful noise. I think Chuck and I are just, I don't know, we're spastic or something. We have a lot of energy, maybe because we eat really well, but we just are so passionate about that. that I think it shines through and people feel the love and, um, and are looking for that connection. And food really brings people together. It, there's something so magic about, um, about food and good food. And it's not complicated. Um, I, I, I spent a lot of time interviewing elders uh, after my book came out, you'll see in the video that a lot of people said, you know, this is the way we ate growing up and we were never sick, you know, people like 70 and above and from different countries. And one of the elders that I met, Rose, who's since passed away, but she was 94, I think, when she passed away, she was from France. And I interviewed her and became good friends with her. And she said to me, and she's like, you know, not even five feet tall. And she said, Hillary, don't forget, she said, simplicity is gourmet. And I thought, oh gosh, that has to be like on my hub someday, my training hub, because it's so true. It really is rather simple. I think with the Food Network and all the magazines and recipes and online stuff, we can get so caught up in trying to create this you know, perfect dinner, or we're afraid to have guests, or we don't know what to feed our kids. But it's really, it, it can become much more intuitive when you just use what's available because local and seasonal you know, pasture-raised meats and stuff are so basic, but so beautiful and so elegant and so gourmet when you just really, they don't take much of anything to prepare them and make them taste delicious. So I think that's what brings people together really is that simplicity that we're all craving because we're living in this world of, you know, it's so fast paced and we don't have time, but when you just take enough time to slow down and be like, huh, that wasn't so complicated. And then you feel that, um, that it, it just feels like, I know when I was introduced to the, the Weston A. Price Foundation, that's what changed my life when I started to heal my family. And I heard the, you know, I, I won't go into it all now, but if you haven't heard of the Weston Price Foundation, I would look it up. And um, when, I, when I heard the story of Weston Price, who was a dentist in the 20s and 30s and traveled around the world and found people thriving free of disease, um, it just made total sense to me. You know, he studied their diets and they were very simple and basic. And, you know, it was before the white flour, the white sugar and all that. So, um, so I'm probably way off topic of the exact question, but I think the training academy, what people leave with is, uh, is this all of a sudden you have this epiphany of, wow, like I've been bitten by the bug. I've been changed forever. I don't know how I'm gonna put all the steps together right away, but I know I have this incredible support system and I know what I want, where I want to head. And I just have to take one 
baby step towards it every day and you know try and be the best version of myself every day and lead mm. with your heart and so it's it's life-changing in that way that you get it and you want more of it I think and people are bringing it, you know, it's not necessarily like, okay, you're coming to the Lunch Leader Training Academy and then, you know, you are a lunch lady immediately. Yeah. It's like you can bring it into your home. You can share it with your communities. And you guys had a principal come um, from Chicago, I think, right? Like people have come from all around the country and probably the world. And she's thinking about bringing it back to her school, I think. Yeah, yeah. we can talk about that. If you want. I mean, she, she came from the, you know, very low income uh, the school was in a very low income neighborhood where 95% of the children were on free and reduced. And uh, she just saw that the travesty of what was being fed to the kids day after day for breakfast and lunch. Um, it's just not, as we know, it's just not really real food. And when I actually started my journey to be changing school lunches was way back before my kids were even in school, I discovered Jamie Oliver and Alice Waters. And I went to the school nurse and I asked for the ingredients of the school food and that's where a lot of people when you're looking for ways to get into your school if you just ask what those ingredients are you can be sure there's going to be some major offenders in there and then they can't really dispute it because there's so much information out there now that you know red dye number 40 and high fructose corn syrup and hydrogenated whatever you know shouldn't be in your kids food so, um, so anyway, yeah, she came and, and got trained and she has, a, I mean, COVID kind of threw a monkey wrench into it and she had support from two other lunch leaders in mm -hmm. Chicago. And then there were actually several, two other lunch leaders that came separately from uh, not too far away in Chicago. So it was, it's really great because they could uh, bounce ideas off of one another and support one another. Um, so now they're kind of back at it after COVID and looking to more privatized lunch program and say no to the government subsidies. And so they have their work cut out for them, but it's, it's possible when you, you know, anything's possible when you have that vision. Some specifics about like the way the lunch leader training Academy works. We, we have a, a, a cycle of it. It's, it is based on ancestral cooking techniques, which are very much the Western a price foundation, um, a, you know, anchors of Philosophy, food, a lot yeah. of bone broth, her bone broth, book, fermented the, foods. the Heal Your Gut Cookbook that she's written has a lot of those things and then goes further into, you know, the GAPS diet. But her book is something that that is a, a feature part that we use and kind of share with people because it can be foundational because of where the food system is right now. I think the primary thing behind what we do is you need to have agency and take control of food as a choice because if you don't cook your own food, then you've outsourced that choice. When you, when you control your food, you control the purchasing of what you're going to make and eat. And then the other side of that is if you decide you're going to not always be able to do that, uh, most likely, but if you, as soon as you uh, outsource that choice, then you've given it up to a system that is very efficient at delivering the things that people will eat in the taste buds. And it's kind of um, immediately, it's, it's uh, regression to the mean, which is just the most profitable items and the, the things that use, at this point, ultra processed foods. So school lunch and the National School Lunch Program basically plays into delivering, uh, at a low cost, schools get the chance to have uh, subsidies to pay for their school lunch program. What we have done is take a look and, and track the food expenses over the last five years as we've been doing this. And the same price that they would charge or to feed and provide processed foods, and we have pictures of them from your school lunch. If you wanna really do something, ask your friends, your kids, their, uh, your, your friends' kids, anybody, take pictures of the school lunch they serve and share it, take a look at it. And then come over to school of lunch and go take a look at the pictures that we're serving. And what we've identified by keeping track with databases and stuff with this is that our food costs are not really any different than what you're paying with the national uh, school lunch program. And you're paying for packaging, <clears throat> you're paying for all these other things. So our, our real goal through the Lunch Leader Training Academy and through the business of School of Lunch and its consulting that we're moving ahead on, it certainly took a dip in the way things went. And we'll talk about the pivot, which is also a part of what we learned. But you, you can take control of your school lunch program. You're going to have the cost of labor that's not figured in and running your own program. But we, will, we show that <clears throat> you can do that. And when you take control of that, the health benefits far outweigh what you're feeding your children. 
what kind of a conscience would you have if you did the best thing you could do and you knew that once you made that choice to go and accept the national school lunch program thing based on dollars, if you really could afford the other one, you need the information and we are the information that shows it really is achievable. You, you, you have to work at it and you have to have a number of people who believe in it, but it starts with one person on the campus. And then it starts with the second person. So if you are two people, this is what we're seeing at these schools all across the country, that they come to the Lunch Leader Training Academy and you have one or two people and they learn what we're talking about in terms of the infusion of these beautiful foods. And so we feed the people who come the very meals that we feed the school lunch program, maybe a little bit fancier, but not really. And then we show them how to prepare those meals. And by the end of the week, they have prepared a meal and shared it for other people that same way. And we bring the farmers from the community, the same people that you're talking about us performing or supporting through farmers footprint. I, I, that's what I have to say. This is such an exciting collaboration because mm -hmm. We support the farmer's footprint every day and every week with the dollars we have in our budget, they go back into the local food system and they support regenerative practices. We definitely wanna support uh, the elimination of chemical and uh, fertilizers and uh, pesticides. So reducing glyphosate, and we've even we've tested ourselves for residues in in uh, in the foods that we've eaten this way. So we understand what you're talking about with farms footprint to eliminate those things and gut dysbiosis and the problems with the endothelial layer and the damage that you can do to your gut. Thus, the Heal Your Gut Cookbook. Every one of these meals we make is designed to support the children's health to become. A uh, a functioning human, which which has full brain capacity, full full health in the midst of these crisis times. What could be more important? Where are you going to spend your dollars? All of the weakness that can be accrued in a child's life, in a person's lifetime, begins with what they are fed when they are away from home. And we take the responsibility. And if a school would take responsibility, each one that does it is a success for those children. You basically are feeding them a third of the meals they're going to eat across a year, you're responsible for it. You are parenting them that way. So it is, I, I just feel like it, every day I wake up, I'm so excited. You go, it, you're, it, you're on a roll it, right it now. Never, I mean, so this is, I can go to my grave and I feel like, okay, on my deathbed, am I gonna be happy with what I did? And at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. And, yeah. and I love the partnership with it. And I love that we're speaking to this audience about it that's targeted at, at supporting these ideas. I'm yeah. right alongside you, Chuck. I think I'd love to dive in a little bit deeper there next because I think you guys have such an amazing and deep commitment to using really high quality foods. And Hillary, you have such a background on the health side of things. And I can only imagine, and I'd love to hear maybe some like stories of awesome of, I call it's like a little phrase, but like stories of awesome, like just those moments of like, aha, or like, wow, that kids have, or you guys have had um, in experiencing like what that really means to put healthy, really nourishing, non-toxic foods in front of kids and knowing that it's supporting a regenerative, you know, circular system that's also supporting farmers. There's just, it's so amazing to me, that piece of it. But let's talk a little bit about that connection that you've seen with the health side between soil health and human health. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't know what it feels like to feel good, right? Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, a lot of these little kids, they can't really even express, but you'll see in the lunch lady, um, video too, there was a little kid who was in sixth grade unprompted who was just like, I used to feel like this all day long. And now I feel like this. And I was just like, right there, that was one of the biggest moments for us because, you know, they can't necessarily express that they're up and down and how they're feeling. I mean, you can see it in a lot of kids, but to be, we don't really even do any dessert. We might get like some, you know, a bumper crop of plums or something that we'll stew down and do a little with raw cream on top or something every once in a blue moon, but they're so satiated. So I think you know, we're, we're overfed and undernourished. So even the adults are, um, you know, the testimonials of, wow, I wasn't hungry for dinner. Even, even I come home and I'm just like, I'm, I'm good. You know, like I just want a cup of tea or a little bone broth or some keeper at night. Like you're, it's so nutrient dense and I don't feed them anything that I wouldn't feed my own family. So it really is. I had an epiphany the other day that it, it doesn't even really have to be called school lunch. It's just lunch. It's like kids menu. We can just get rid of that, right? It's it's not school food. It's just food. It's just real. And it's the way life should be, right? And so um, we've had a lot of testimonials. Even uh, one of the teachers said the other day, you know, I, 
continue working on his health. He initially lost like 30 pounds right in the beginning uh, when we first started. And a lot of you know teachers were like, whoa, what's going on? What is bone broth and why do I feel this way? And he just said, oh my gosh, being back and having your food, I went for a run and I, I felt noticeably different. Like I had so much more energy just from a few days of having your lunch. So, um, you know, I mean, I, we have so many testimonials. I'm trying to think it's, it's really like the, the kids and I think the feeling that they feel, they express like just the other day, the first day of school, I think it was, or maybe the second, these kids rewrote the, the school gratitude song to like, make it about um, the food and, you know, how they just, they, they brought me over and I was like almost in tears, just like, oh my gosh. So I can see the, um, the light bulbs and more so just the feeling of feeling truly loved and truly nourished and that deep appreciation. So um, well, yeah, we, we have a financial commitment to uh, support and purchase from farmers. So, you know, to describe what School of Lunch is and really what uh, our school lunch program is what Hillary had done was she was shopping. She was shopping for food at farmers markets. So all of our food that we're feeding the kids, 90% of it comes directly. We purchase directly from farmers and we've assembled uh, over the course of the years, um, you know, kind of a supply chain that is able to be repeated that all of the components exist within any major city and most small cities the successes in the food distribution system allow us to kind of replicate it. So today's Wednesday and Hillary used to go to the farmer's market in Santa Monica, which is noticed, which is noted as the probably the number one farmer's market in the U S. And so on a day like today, we go down there and the best restaurant chains on the West coast in Los Angeles are all shopping and the trucks are there and they're buying all the food. So it's the restaurant chains, it's the food distribution companies. And we are shopping for the same food that the, uh, the best restaurants are paying the same prices. It's surprisingly reasonable, especially if you purchase at wholesale. And so that knowledge, we, that's some of the stuff we can share, but that's what I'll bring back going to farmer's markets a couple of times a week. And then we bring that and that gets translated into from you know sliced vegetables and snacks for the kids. We also are able to bring raw dairy in. We make a raw dairy keeper so we can increase gut you know, health through uh, dairy and fermented products. Bacteria, yeah. we, we have a fermenter who buys all of her product from farmer's markets as well. So we have partnerships with different small scale artisan producers, but those are the things that end up on the table for the kids. So really, if you open up the doors to the refrigerator, you're gonna find locally grown or Southern California region you know, beef, uh, high, high quality chicken, uh, the pork comes from small artisan producer as well. Those things get delivered into a system and, and we also buy from uh, food distribution companies, but we are able to buy, like we serve a lot of bacon. It comes from Nyman Ranch, which holds up a really high standard. We've decided all those choices are worth it. And when you buy, uh, you can find the products and get them and you can say, I'm gonna spend a little more here and a little less there. So everything we go to feed the kids at school is the same food we would buy at home, only purchased through these other types of outlets. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a far, it's a true farm to school, you know, farm to every meal yeah. is farm to table, it's been said to me. But this one, you're just gonna open up the cabinets and all those things. Well, yeah. yeah, and the other thing is we're really no, a no waste kitchen. We really don't have, you know, we have our, we compost everything. We use what we have. So we're always constantly in conversation about like, what do we have? And, if, and the farmers are very generous. You know, a lot of stuff they have to take back to the farm and they don't want to take anything back to the farm. A lot of, oh, shoot. Oh, geez. It had to happen. All in the family. The this is out. the best part about Zoom. <laughs> so, um, so as I say that, um, oh, so we get like, you know, we'll get extras or surplus if they have it, they're happy to give it to us or at cost or, um, you know, sharpen their pencils, whatever they can do. And they understand that this is going to the children. And it's so important that we, um, and this is sort of a, a bottom up education as the kids go home and start talking about this with the parents. And a lot of parents are like, what's going on at school? And then they, I mean, now in the beginning, now I think most of them know what's up, but um, you know, then this becomes sort of, they're all of a sudden the parents are buying sourdough bread or they're wanting to get bone broth. And so we did, you know, produce a little bit in the beginning to try and um, help out parents. And we, we've given parents so many connections to local farmers. And even when 
when COVID happened, I want to make sure to to talk about this. Mm-hmm. We pivoted um, because we had to close down the kitchen, and we came up with a the lunch box we called it, which was really a beautiful box of farm fresh foods, and we came up with um, you know, how many recipes? Six weeks of recipes and rotation 30 recipes recipes that were kid friendly you know the kids they were simple enough that the kids could put them together so the idea was to empower the kids to step into the kitchen relieve the parents a little bit of you know now managing everything including school lunch um and so really beautiful pasture meats eggs raw cheese and so we continued that awareness of your local farmers and nourishing yourself across COVID. And we put how much money back into the local food system? Oh, we spent $115,000 with the farmers. The, the school charged for lunch and they did an online. So it's a private school and they had tuition and they still, like everybody, switched to virtual school. But what they kept is a commitment to the food program to help both us and then to honor our commitment to the local farmers. They felt they wanted to keep the dollars coming through. So we delivered six six different versions of boxes, five meals each week. And every Friday we had a crew of people. We, we I would shop across the week, deliver everything to the school in the we same space. And we basically turned it into an assembly line. And on Fridays we dispersed seven or eight drivers and went into the canyons and all the different parts. Everybody lived all over the place in Los know, Angeles. Right? <laughs> so we divided it and we became a distribution food distribution company, but we bought from the same people. And we sent a menu out, and so there were five meals, so those 30. Yeah. Running a program in a five-day cycle is another thing that's a real efficiency that we, I just want to say that. Well, the planning. systems, too, and getting the whole family involved. I want to, you touched on this a little bit, but getting the kids involved, getting both parents involved. I mean, if you're, if you're a, you know, two parents in the household, if you're a single, I've been a single parent, too, that's very difficult and challenging, but whatever you can do, you do, but everybody needs to be involved. This cannot fall on the shoulders of one person anymore. And I feel like a lot of moms are carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders and trying to do everything and falling short in every area and then feeling like a failure. And so simple things, stepping in as, um, as a spouse and maybe helping to plan for the week or make, making nu- nutrition a priority and saying, you know, we're going to talk about this each week and I'm going to order the meats and I'm going to go to the farmer's market or you could do this and the kids could do this. Um, because it need, we need to get back to that. We need to spread it out so that it's not all falling on one person's shoulders and you're getting home from work exhausted and you're like, let's just order something because I'm cooked, you know? So, and then when you have those systems, if he's pulling a pork shoulder or a chuck roll out of the freezer and letting it thaw and salting it, then I just know, okay, if we've communicated, I got to throw it in the oven and it, or it goes overnight and it's done and we have meat for three days, you know? So it's that there's systems that we've developed and that's what we're looking to pass on to people that it doesn't have to be rocket science. It doesn't have to take a lot of time, mm-hmm. but when you develop those systems and you work together, you can really feed your family nutrient dense foods, delicious foods, um, and, and you don't have to break the bank doing it. You have to be committed and that's one thing that I, I ask that people just, this is one, one thing, if you can do one thing, just decide, just decide to step into your kitchen and just decide to want to know more and to do better. And that's all maybe you'll do for the next month is to say, I'm ready, I'm going to do this. And then bit by bit, like I said, because you can't do it all at once, but you, you just decide that this is going to become a priority. Mm, that's such an amazing call to action. I think there's so many folks in this community who have like the space to be able to to just slowly start to incorporate that. And I think that's a really, really beautiful point. So that's something too that I'm holding on um, as far as just the the power of choice and agency in this and just knowing that like that is available to most people. And if you do have it, that's a huge privilege and it's almost like a responsibility in some ways. Like how are you leaving a fingerprint? on you know, your local farmers and their livelihoods, as well as the kiddos that are in your lives or in your community. So, so huge. I wanna leave so much space for questions because I, I feel like there's been so many exciting ones coming through the chat, um, but also it's a, it's a really intimate, amazing group. And I wanna give folks the opportunity if there is you know, a curiosity that you have and you'd love to ask Hillary and Chuck, we can also um, have you raise your hands. You can head over to participants and then there should be a button that says raise hand. Um, you guys can ask a question directly. So feel free to raise your hand if you have a question or if you're on video, you can just like wave around and I'll, I'll tap you in. Um, cool. And in, in the meantime, we did have some come through on the chat. 
Um, Jennifer asked a really amazing question about something that I'm really curious about too, of just like challenges and barriers that you guys have had. So Jennifer is really curious, like how have you nav navigated non-believers in this journey, um, especially in the school system, hospitals and government entities, food just isn't on the radar. So I'm sure you guys have, it hasn't been a cakewalk. So I'd love to hear a little yeah. bit more behind the curtains of challenges, barriers, pushback, confusion, anything like that. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's really hard because I think food is so personal and we've become so disconnected from our land and our animals and um, just simple nourishment. And so people can get really offended by your choice to do better or that this is um, elitist or whatnot. And so um, I think, uh, what am I trying to say? That I guess what I've found is that for me, there is no, choice. I've seen the power of food as medicine and I've seen the destruction of disease. And I can say without a doubt that there is nothing more sacred than a healthy child. And there's nothing more heartbreaking than watching somebody suffer. And so to, I know a lot of um, spouses fight over the cost of food. And this is where I think you have to come together at this point in humanity there, there can't even, I mean, of course you buy what you can afford and you cook real food. That is my, my thing. You can't, of course, we come from all different, um, you know, backgrounds and what one can afford somebody else may not, but you try to keep it just real food um, and make it a priority because if you don't have your health, you have nothing. And if we lose our local farmers, we really have nothing. So this is a moment I feel like in, in time and humanity that we've been given this collective I always say like my million dollar question was like, how do we wake people up before the wake up call? How do you wake people up before they get the cancer diagnosis or they have, you know, can't get pregnant, which is what happened to me. Or, you know, you have some devastating diagnosis or a sick child. It's like, we've been pretty much, I feel like with COVID given a collective frying pan to the head that this is our <laughs> wake up call as humans to decide to do better. And again, bit by bit. And I think it's a really beautiful thing when we raise that vibration and we're all kind of like, we don't know how we're going to do it all yet, but we want to do it for the greater good of humanity. And so there are this, there is this sort of like, how, how can people put this in front of children and think that this is okay? You know, when you look at a lot of the school lunches, but I think again, it's that disconnect or that overwhelm, um, or maybe there's some sort of, um, and, and there's just not the knowledge. We've lost that ancestral wisdom. So my other call to action is that we need to become the ancestors in training. We've lost, we've broken that knowledge that comes from grandmothers and great grandmothers to be passed down so that this next generation of kids knows how to cook, knows how to nourish themselves, knows how to get outside and connect with the, the land. And so we have to decide right now, like right here, it's a moment to become that ancestor in training and decide to learn so that we can pass it down. Yeah, um, you, it's really the word is resistance, yeah, and I would say resistance. What you encounter is the strength of the inertia of where we are with our cultural evolution. You know, anthropologically, we are a body that's designed to consume whole foods in their uh, most accessible forms. For us, uh, I know what I feel good on those foods, you know, paying attention to that. For me, I understand that roster of foods and um, they tend to express what genetic evolution would really tell me. You can read and find your path whichever way you want with that, but it's going to be whole nutritious foods and it's going to be purchased directly from farmers and it's going to be pretty easy to cook and it's going to taste freaking great because it is from the ground with organic farmers and it's, it feels good and there's, there's your energy. Uh, that's the simple answer, but the inertia and all of the food system is designed to support uh, profitability. So with that in place, you really, anytime you go into a system that's in place, you're going to encounter the resistance. So we go where water flows, which is where people know this change needs to take place. And right now that freedom is, it exists in uh, private schools, uh, but it does exist in public schools. And some of the ways we've seen that happen where people would say no to the free and reduced lunch program is they have collective nonprofits that would do things. I think it's really easy to think about a sports team. Like after school sports is something you're gonna pay for. You're gonna pay for the uniforms. 
you're going to pay for to be on a team or the marching band, same way they have expenses. And so they'll hire a director and they'll pay for someone to do uh, coordination, giant dance moves for a really complex marching band routine at the halftime, right? I mean, that's teams of people. Think about what it would mean if you made that same commitment, if, if everybody understood that they could make that same commitment inside their school lunch program. So you have districts and, and um, each school has a principal and then they also have a bottom line. It gets complicated really quick within the public school system, but the nonprofits that make a contribution to help support um, other ideas in terms of improving education, that's what we've seen that parent teacher organizations or supporting groups, like there's one called uh, the Chicago Lutheran Education Foundation, or they work together to support 10 schools and they raise money privately and they're looking to build a kitchen that would control and increase the quality of the food. Um, the inertia, it takes place in the hospitals, the school systems, and many, many places because it's just really convenient. But one of the things we've realized is convenience in the distribution system, it works both ways. It doesn't just deliver crappy food, it delivers the best food. So restaurants are ordering the best foods. It's what are you going to order from that food distribution system? If you lock into the free or the national school lunch program, you are going to be buying what's approved in the uh, dietary guidelines, which is a problem. But if you take control of the kitchen choices, the food distribution system will sell you anything you want at a great price and they'll love the repeat business. So you have power within that framework to be able to use what's, you know, what can take you down and to make a good set of choices. So really it boils down to the frame of reference that you use when you look at your opportunity to feed people. Uh, you may have a little bit more of an expense, but you know you're gonna get the benefit of doing, uh, you, you can do it, you can do it. So we approach it with yeah. optimism. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because I think the there's things that I'm not an expert on, like you know the National School Lunch Program. And I know that you guys being at a private school, um, there's different challenges and barriers than a public school would face. So thank you so much for bringing that resource of ways that nonprofits are engaging and kind of subsidizing some of the opportunities within different systems than you've had success in. Because it's, we need all of it. I think I'm, I'm very much so like, it's not a versus or like a and or, it's like the infinite possibility of if a, you know, a mom and a principal like teamed up in a public school system in an inner city area, like what could happen there? There is no limit on what could happen. So it's so cool to be equipped with resources and also just really inspiring to hear how it's worked really well for you guys. So I wanna yeah. toss the mic, oh, sorry. So I was just gonna say that's, you know, I got my foot in the door at this small private school, but I was like, this is my key to just show what's possible, to show what can be done. We call it like the lab, you know, we're just like trying all the things and so, um, I really do believe with uh, a lot of heart and that passion and the desire to do good. If you can get your superintendent on board, you, you just start where you are. You have to meet people where they are too. You can't come in like guns blaze and like, we got to change it. That's what I did back in Massachusetts. And then we're like, oh God, here she comes again. You know, so you have to be, because we've, you know, we didn't get here overnight, right? So we're not gonna <laughs> fix it overnight. So we have to take the, again, those baby steps and meet people where they are and come in with like, let's let's talk about this because we know in our hearts, there's a better way. Yeah, uh, I people saying, being another, people. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, another exciting thing because I see Jennifer from Pastures of Grace I know, I is on here. She's cooking. <laughs> and uh, just what, one of the things is if you make the commitment and you're doing something a little bit different, uh, Everybody wants to be a part of it, especially the local farmers. They will come in, you can feature them, you know, as we have more people are able to come back to schools. We have something called Parents at Lunch, it's Pal Day. So we tried to bring a farmer in once a month. And that story, and especially in light of social media, when somebody's got an artisan food business or something, or they're a local farmer, or they're, let's say a lot of schools benefit inside the uh, the public schools, they'll be able to bring like a local chef in the area because the school district has some money and they're saying, we're going to work within the framework of the national school lunch program. But we're going to hire a, a really well-known chef. There's a lot of passion that comes in that way. You don't have to buy packaged food off the back of the truck. People do it in different ways. So you will see examples of school systems that are buying really good foods. Uh, they tend to not be able to feature the healthy foods that we get to feature, like raw dairy and uh, the bone broths and all these things and high fat foods, which are so crucial for 
uh, brain development and children's health. So we have a benefit in the flexibility, but they're, but they're out there. Mm, so important. Thank you so much for bringing that up as well. Yes. Jesse, I want to ask you to unmute Jesse Thomas and see if you can get your question. Hey, what's going on? Hi. Um, well, this is really cool. And I've really enjoyed listening to you guys talk. And, um, you know, where I live, I live in Montana and there's like, I could walk to a number of farms that would fall all over themselves to give food to kids. And this week is our first week of school and I won't make this too long, but <clears throat> we have a lot of, like we live in a town where there's all this access to local food and everybody kind of knows that like the school lunch program is like yucky, but they're sort of like not willing to, it's for some reason controversial. There's a lot of physicians that are <laughs> ironically involved in, you know, there's a lot of kids that like go to my kid's school, their parents are physicians and they're really, I don't know, somehow opposed to thinking this way or, or thinking about how to do this. And I don't want to, I don't want to stir anything up. I don't want to stir. Well, I do want to stir people up. Actually, I really like want to grab people and shake them, but, um, you know, how do you get, you know, I'll just give you an example. I went to, I went to get my son today. We have a ton of parents who are super concerned about COVID and, and, and some of it's valid and some of it's just, you know, fear that they have that's maybe not warranted. Um, and I go to get my son today or yesterday, and he had a sucker in his hand. That was like the first day of school. That was this, that was the thing that they handed out to the kids. Yeah. And they, you know, there's a lot of like really worried upper middle class white women in my community that, and I'm not targeting anyone, just saying yeah. that are really concerned about COVID. And they think that the only thing they can do is put a mask on their kid and hand sanitizer. And, and they're missing this giant um, action item of getting better food, not just in the mouths of their kids, but the whole freaking community. So community immunity through food. And um, I have all these like big ideas I want to say, and I just, I, I, I don't know quite where to start because everything is so emotional right now. And so like with COVID, you guys already had your program established. You're working in a private school. So those things are really great. And you have a lot of parents who are willing and on board. Maybe they even, you guys planted the seed about how nutrition can make you more resilient to COVID because I still think there's a lot of people in my community and specifically who think that COVID is going to go away. And it's not. And so it's a matter of how do we get our kids resilient to it. So I think when the specifically when I'm talking about the public school system, where do you start? Um, how do you start? I mean, I know I've read lots of good books about it, but the funding thing is really hard. And so Chuck, you bringing up the nonprofit idea was cool. And I kind of, you know, think that might be an option because I can name off, I could find the phone numbers of like 10 farmers right now who would like drive to the school right mm -hmm. this minute with truckloads of food and like deliver it because they want to do this. Like it matters to them. It matters mm -hmm. to me as a mother. I see all these little sweet baby children struggling with their behavior because of neuroinflammatory conditions that are completely food related. So mm -hmm. I guess like my question is how do you or what would be the best step of action to take in a community where, you know, people are maybe a little bit lost on COVID and we've got all this access to local food. Yeah. I, oh my gosh. So much of that resonates with me because I've been like, Oh, like if we could just get this next generation of kids could understand how miraculous their bodies are and that they're designed to work and that we are forever going to be confronted with all sorts of viruses, fun we, we live symbiotically with viruses, fungi, bacteria, parasites, we're in fact more of those guys than we are humans. So we have to understand that whole bigger picture and that there's always gonna be something, something that is um, you know, uh, a threat, right? So the power of a healthy immune system is everything. And when I see these little kids like mask on, mask off, mask on, and, and they're little. And you know, there's some of that at our school, they have to do it and I'm just like, this is, so hard for me because I just want them to be so confident in the power of food and food as medicine. And if you treat your body the way that it is in intended to be treated, 
with real food and healthy sunshine and good sleep and movement and friendship and laughter, all the things that, you know, we used to value and, um, and step out of the fear and into the empowerment, then that, that, those are the kids that we want to raise. We don't need to confuse them with like, we, and we don't want to raise a generation that are so afraid of everything. And of course, like all about healthy soil and the soil within and soil without, you want your kids, we've been saying for decades, dig in the dirt, that's better, right? And now they're afraid of everything and hand sanitizing and, and all of that. So I think like, you know, if you look back at previous war times, you know, you, you have like a bomb shelter, you'd go in the basement or you get under a desk. I think of like food is our bomb shelter. So as parents, we can say, and as schools, we can say, this is what we're prioritizing because we want to keep our children safe. And this is the way, this is the number one way, you know, of course, getting them outside and all the healthy habits, but it starts with food. It starts with food. And so I think if you start with a dedicated group of parents and you appeal to, I always say, you know, just gotta, my, my grandfather used to say, you don't gotta have anything, but you gotta have heart. And I think at this point in humanity that we have to appeal to the heart space and like, what are we doing to our children? Are we driving them towards the medical system and a life of disease where they're gonna be struggling and it's just gonna perpetuate and they're gonna give birth to children who have more things that we've never heard of? Or are we gonna stay, take a stand right now and decide that we're gonna to decide to know better so that we can do better? And that's like the farmer's footprint is a great resource. And so the more we can all start sharing resources and empowering one another, um, you know, it's not easy, but it makes like, to me, it just makes sense. But fear is a very hard barrier to, to bust down. But what but. breaks that, so <laughs> some of the lessons, okay, th this is where I want to thank Slow Food as an organization and what it meant to host a nonprofit organization that really was focused on just bringing people together. So what you have is you have uh, a feeling that these moms, again, that are nurturing, that you're, you represent that voice that we have heard your plea on every call. I just want you to know it's there. And then you go up against the system. So you have to find, I'm going to reference something. If you haven't read the book by Charles Eisenstein called The um, More Beautiful World, yeah, the more beautiful world. Our Hearts Know It's Possible. You have to understand that you are the flower growing between the cracks and the concrete. And you are going to come up regardless and you're going to spread but that concrete is there and you don't know if you'll be recognized or if you'll be mowed over but you're not going away you're <laughs> going to come back right okay so what do you do with that well a nonprofit organization could do something we just spoke to a guy in prescott arizona he was on fire he's an entrepreneur he's what happened is they have a change they have a change in one of the administrators and that administrator she has it on her list some things to make some changes to make it happens to be one of them is food. And he's a person aware and shares our values around food. So they have a little perfect fit. Guess what else they have? They have a kitchen that is sitting unused. They have two or three pieces in place that give them a chance to kind of assemble an alternative. But wait a second, how is he gonna to get together and tell these people the story that he thinks we could fund the kitchen, we could hire the people, he knows a local chef, we could work with the local farmers like you, uh, and, and we could probably do this because Chuck and Hillary said it's cost effective and they have some parts of their consulting, that's what they do. Well, the nonprofit side told me that when you, I learned bringing people together, what he wanted to do is the exact same thing I would recommend, which is to have a meal showing what a school of lunch meal looks like. We, our pork shoulder, our slow roasted pork shoulder with guacamole, black beans and rice, and chopped tomatoes and a fermented salsa and creme fraiche and chopped cilantro and uh, a salad. That is a lunch we would serve to school. And that, that is what we've served countless times when we get people together for a slow food dinner. Now, if they had a glass of wine then and they had a chance to go, let's get together as people and let's find where we're sharing that little crack coming up and something special then you have a chance to have a conversation. How do you feel with that food and the sense of space and all the changes you made? With that event, you can start to bring people together in a conversation. What's gonna happen is you're gonna find other people you didn't know existed within the framework, within the framework you're trying to establish. 
So the simple act of the cooking is also the way to lead towards the transition you want. You need to take a big breath because it can take some time. But if you brought those farmers who then talked to the school administrator and the school chef and said, man, we'd love to bring some of these here cattle to you. I got a lot, you know. And, and if the meal had to do with their food and one of their guys cooked it, but if your school chef cooked it or somebody who would actually do the work and it was simple, you show them the example and then you showed them, well, we also know that this other school does it every day and their price points are not different than what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So we provide a daily example for you to point at and say, they did it, they did it. Mm -hmm. And kind of wave a flag. You want us to just to say it, We our, our future for us is to help more yeah. and more schools make this change. And, and I think also sending, sending uh, a couple of representatives to be trained at the academy mm -hmm. is crucial because then if you have a couple of people that get it, then they can spearhead and really um, and demonstrate that uh, those beautiful meals and and they have the foundation, the core knowledge of um, you know the ancestral wisdom and the traditional methods of cooking and proper preparation mm -hmm. of all of it. So and that dinner will draw people to you. It's the first way to start to build a community. And we know that you can't have these values and be by yourself. And but the community is there, and the knowledge is right there. We're just all kind of separated from nature. And so what you're really doing is asking to be connected with nature's nutrition for us. And that's our callback. And that's the thing you can always say, we're just asking to do what nature is. So never lose sight. Your intuition is spot on. Yeah. I wanna, I wanna jump into and say, Jesse, if you're looking to gather community in your space, it's probably specific to your school, but maybe there's folks in your region or in other areas that are doing something similar. So lean on the farmer's footprint community. I can help kind of see people in your region. And if it feels like an alignment, we can kind of make some connections in that way. So thank you so much for that question. Thank you so much for that beautiful answer. And I want to just get through, we had like three kind of rapid fire questions come in. Um, so maybe we could just take maybe like 30 seconds or a minute and just answer them. They're pretty, pretty uh, granular, I guess we could say, but yeah. <laughs> so um, Brenda is really curious about what age are the kids you guys are cooking for? And um, like, is it a primary school? So and how many kids too? Yeah, actually would be useful. K through 12 now. We used to um, be, it used to be uh, four through 12 and now they've added K one, two, three. So, uh, so now it's all the way through. So it's quite different. I mean, today I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's so different to feed a little kindergartner and see what goes on their plate versus the high schooler who is just like, you know, coming back for seconds and thirds and could eat all day. So, um, so yeah, so that's the range. And then we have about 120 kids and 25 staff, 125 kids and 25 staff. So it's 150 total. Wow. Well, wow, it's a big staff too. That's an amazing team to be built around and support these kids and feed the teachers and everything too. It's awesome. Good to see the, uh, the mentorship and that when, when the teachers sit down with the kids or the older kids are showing, you know, they're the high schoolers are serving, helping us serve. So they're encouraging the mm. little kids to try new things. So it's, it's really beautiful that way. It's so good. And then Catherine is wondering, do you have a rotation of meals that you follow and what are some of your systems in the kitchen? We're, uh, we, we're based on, we have a program called the 20 menus for change. So basically we cycle through each in four weeks, you can move through the 20 menus and just repeat them over across the year and make modifications. That way your staff starts to understand. So we have uh, really easy meals on a Monday. Um, we have a rotation we have to respond to because there are kids that go out on the land at the Manzanita school. So we bake breads and do things for sandwiches. Yeah, we do another uh, farmer's market. Wednesday is going to be another easy one. Yeah. Thursday is a soup and a focaccia, which is a, a homemade yeah. sourdough instead of bread again. Friday is slow roasted meats that we plan. And so we try to yeah. cap it that way. So each week looks like that with variety. It's really like heavy on Monday. Monday's a go in and you're preparing all the meats and preparing the sourdough. So Sunday night I start, I feed the starter and make the levon and bring it in. Monday morning, we start that whole process. And then Tuesday, it's a sandwich day where some kids are out on the land and some kids are sitting down. Um, so that's all of the like the roast, the roast beef and the roasted chickens. Then we take our bones from our roasted chickens and we turn those into bone broth, which then Wednesday is more of a put together meal, um, you know, like an enchilada pie or, you know, homemade mac and cheese or something. And then Thursday is that um, soup salad focaccia where we use our bone broths 
And then Friday, again, we prepared meats. Like today we salted our chuck roll that will then go into the ovens tomorrow to slow roast all day. And then Friday makes for sort of an easier day where it's like, ah, oh, the main, you know, the meat is done and we can just shred it up. And then we just have to fill in with all the other stuff. So as in, it's, it, we've got the systems down. There's always, but then we change with the seasons too. So that's what's mm. nice about the soup. So focaccias, we can use whatever's in season, whatever we have a bumper crop of and switch up the flavors and the colors and all that. So cool. So, so good. I want to put the call out for just, are there any other questions um, before we kind of transition and release everyone back into their beautifully, hopefully restful, creative in the kitchen? I see you over there, Jennifer, evenings. <laughs> I have to give her a shout out. Everybody should go check out Pastures of Grace, the most beautiful pastured pork and the most heart-centered farmers. Uh, just please, you guys, please post their their website and check out yes. all doing really amazing, amazing work, yeah. Oh, this is amazing. Checking this out right now. Okay, it's in the chat, y'all. I love this. Yeah. Um, oops, sorry. Thank you guys so much. So, I mean, I think I love to end these sessions, Hillary and Chuck also with, with just a question of like, if you could put an ask out to this community, to any community right now, like, do you have anything that you need, that you really, really need, that you would just like to put out into the ether? I think that's such a powerful question. And if it's not now, it can be later. Um, but yeah, is there anything that top of mind, you're like, we need this for ourselves or just generally in the system of school kiddos and lunches or specifically to your team? We need, we need to see another school commit to this. We've talked to people for the last couple of years and I'm, you know, we're, we're close. Um, we need to get that next school over the hump. We're, we we're talking to people, but I mean, we need to see it in action. We're excited to see another one take place no matter how difficult it is. It could happen in Chicago, Salt Lake, uh, somewhere in Maine, uh, Prescott, Arizona, but we need to see that next thing where people understand and commit to this. And we are there 100% to make it happen for somebody else. And it's gonna snowball. So yeah. we, we know it's a moment. Well, yeah, and I would say we, we did have a 19 year old um, oh, yes. young man come to oh. the training academy from the Sacramento area. And he's taken on three schools, uh, acting academies. They're, it's a global network of schools. So if he were like, if Trevor can do this in Sacramento and he just sent us his menu rotation last night, so he's just, he's 19. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're incredible. So, but he's got his family support. He's got the school parent support. Like everyone's helping him. We've connected him with people up there who do sourdough and know the farmers. So that to me is like amazing to see him taking this on at the young age of 19. So, um, so it is happening in the Prescott, Arizona. I mean, so people are, the swirl is happening and certainly right now we're getting a little bit more exposure. So spreading the word of, of um, you know, what we do. Certainly uh, I call myself a techno dino because oh, like the interwebs and all that are challenging for me. So I do what I can on Instagram, but um, you know, I know with these millennials, there's, there's easier ways and more efficient ways to spread the words. We really appreciate you guys who have such a large audience just shouting our, our names up because we're kind of like the little engine that could we just know this is so possible and what's needed so any help um uh, spreading the word we also when we run our lunch leader training academies we have several attendees attend through our angel program where people can just donate the money to send a through our nonprofit to send uh somebody who really has the passion to go, but can't necessarily afford it. We never want money to be a barrier. I feel like if someone has that passion to do this, then we have to help them get there. So if you know any angels, we're always looking for people to help uh, people attend and really fulfill their dreams and to go do good work. So- uh, Yes. That's, yeah, and just really to, to make that decision to step into your kitchen and to do your best to support your local farmers and your local food system and lead by example. Because, you know, as I say with, um, I do a little being human thing with Hilda Labrada Gore, who's uh, the Wise Traditions podcast, she's amazing, but we remind people every week what it means to truly be human. And so just remember to stay human in these crazy times. Um, we call ourselves the good crazies, but more is caught than taught. So Joy says that, and it's so true, right? So the more you can just lead by example and model for your kids and model for the other moms and dads out there and just say, you know, we're going to be the best examples of ourselves we can be every day. I think that's 
what we can ask of you know everybody is to just be the best version of yourself every day and um, and take control of your own health decide that you you heal you you um you're responsible for your health really so don't don't outsource it just decide no matter where you are you can reverse so many things i believe really everything um can come back to homeostasis really uh you know of course there's a balance and things that are more severe than others but the body is miraculous so that trust mm -hmm. trust in your body and, and just pass that on to the next next generation and we want these these young ladies the young women and you know the high school to be thinking about oh, i want to like be in balance so i can give birth and pass on a good healthy microbiome to the next you know my kids and start off with really happy healthy kids and what an uh, what an amazing final impression to leave everyone on this call with and so many of the countless others there were so many folks in the community who were like is there a replay i'm so excited so thank you guys Sure. Just thank you for doing the incredible work that you're doing. Um, we had a, someone come in through the chat, like the little engine that could, you guys are out there. You are every single day feeding kids, holding their hands, sprinkling love into their lives. They're bringing it home to their parents. You're looping in, you know, connections with farmers. This is a really, really incredible thing that you are, you know, I always talk about like the difference between vocation and, you know, calling it. I get the sense that this feels like a calling for you from what Chuck, you and Hillary have both said. So Thank you for imprinting us of like, do one small thing and you never know what it becomes. That sense of possibility feels so tangible to me right now. And I'm so on board of like, what can be next? Like, who is the school that does this next? How do we connect you with them? So if there's any way that we can be supportive to your work or anyone here, I wanted to drop in following all the ways that you can follow School of Lunch, Hillary and Chuck on their website, Instagram, Facebook, reach out to them directly if you have any questions get involved with their lunch training academy. It's such an important, incredible program to equip people with skills to bring home into their own communities. It's just fabulous, guys. I really, really, really just appreciate it. Um, and before um, I release everyone kind of back into the wild, this is how we got connected with you. Um, Jesse Gardner, who's on the call, created this gorgeous back to school blog. That is, if you're a parent or a caretaker, a grandma, mama, and papa, um, there is gonna be this tons of resources listed in there for you. So this is a really cool jumping off point and starting point. And then I also wanted to just call everyone's attention to an event that we're hosting on September 18th that's in line, but a little bit different. Um, and it's focused on, you know, school gardens and as that being another avenue for kids to get involved and see what the whole process is like from, you know, growing a tomato to transforming it and taking it home. Um, so Grow Some Good is an organization that's doing some incredible work in Hawaii and we're speaking with their program manager. So like Hillary and Chuck, you said, like part of this is the ecosystem. It's weaving the web. It's starting to know other people who are doing similar aligned, tangible work and just helping each other. Thank you guys so, so much. Thank Very you. It's such it's an awesome. honor to be pleasure. on with yeah. this and, and, and re really grateful for what you guys are doing. The blog is amazing. The writing and the statistics and the information are extremely compelling and it's really uh, it's it's a it's a really well curated site yeah no and we're blessed to be able to share these stories definitely. Yeah, that's been a big inspiration um throughout all of the the pandemic and and even before that we would be in the butcher shop or at the farmer's market doing the four minute work we, we, were, do we were doing it today we probably should do it right <laughs> now <laughs> when you just need to just laugh a little and get a little movement just good just don't 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 hesitate yeah <laughs> Coffee tab, whatever you gotta do. Stretch it out. Stretch Maybe. it out. Anyway, <laughs> we had our you lunch. You guys are amazing. <laughs> we really, really just appreciate the the feel. The the I mean, he's just so eloquent, and everything you guys do is so beautiful and feels so right. Right, it just feels right. And I think that's what we're looking for everybody to just really get still and feel how right it is when you're in alignment with all that surrounds us and all that's within us. Mm. Cheers to that. So humbled, so grateful to share space with you guys and really appreciate being able to, you know, amplify the incredible work that you are doing. That is a gift. So thank you to and you. We're, we're really accessible. We'd love to jump on a call with anybody and answer questions and just inspire you to take action. So reach out awesome. anytime and follow us on, on Instagram. We're usually like burning down the house in the kitchen and, um, <laughs> and you know, it's fast paced and I'm like, oh, I don't really have time for this, but I'm going to try and show what we're doing. So if you want to see how it is in the kitchen, you can follow along at School of Lunch. Awesome, y'all. Well, thank you so, so much. You guys have a good, good night. rest of your evening. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.